start off by just telling you a story this morning. Um, it's a story of a freshly minted lieutenant with the Aurora Fire Department. And uh, it starts right here at the firehouse. But this is kind of a, a, a rough story. This is a story of my nightmare, what wakes me up at night, what keeps me up at night, and what makes me strive to be better and do the best every single day. So as I said, firehouse, every morning across the country, firefighters, paramedics, lieutenants, captains, all walk into the firehouse or into their station and they get ready to go to work, right? So they check out their equipment, they do all of the work that they need to do to get ready for the day, and contrary to popular opinion, they don't just play and roughhouse around all the time. A lot of times they're trying to do the best they can for their job. But there's something that firefighters need, an insatiable desire every single day, and that's food. We have to eat, especially those truckers. You've got to feed the truckers so they can go and take a nap after lunch, right? So we're really trying to work on a lot of that stuff. So as we get everything checked out, we go out to the um, grocery store. We get all the food that we need and start cooking. And we sit around the table, and we're all having fun and enjoying ourselves. And then calls drop, right? We're expected to go to calls. So in this case, on this morning, we get a call like this. Truck 2, Tower 8 is a rig, Battalion 1, Chief 7. It's going to be a good structure fire. Address uh, is around 17th and Peoria. We don't have an exact yet. Uh, engine 3, Engine 2, Truck 2, Truck 8 does the rig. Battalion 1 and Chief 7, this is going to be a good fire. Respond to 17th and Peoria. Um, TAC 4, TAC 4. Okay, I got 1747 is the correct address. And engine two, command, be aware we have multiple parties trapped. I believe they said 307. So I can see the firefighters in the room twisting in their seat and itching, excited, right? Holy cow! Okay, so we have a confirmed fire with trap parties in an apartment complex. This is like the Super Bowl for us firefighters. We love this. So what do we all do? Kick the chairs over, and we start running down the hallway to get into the bay and get on our rig, right? So as I'm starting to run that way, what's immediately happened? I know what's happening to me right now. I'm getting an epinephrine dump, right? I'm getting really excited. I'm starting to get all spiked up. I'm not necessarily, necessarily focusing on what I should be doing specifically toward this incident. Everybody else isn't thinking about that, especially the firefighters in the back. They are running as fast as they can because this is a fire. Sweet. We never get these anymore, right? So I run. I get over to the engine. I go to put on my bunker pants, and I'm donning my bunker pants, and I put one foot in, and I put the other foot in, and I go to pull it up. And all of those shoulder straps are in between my legs. So now I can't get it up. So I'm really behind the eight ball now, right? So I got to take my pants back off, fix the straps, pull the bunker pants back up. And then my hood is down in the bottom of my foot. <sighs> Jesus, what's going on here? OK, so now I got to undo that again, reach down, pull out my hood, put the hood back on. My mind is now starting to spin a little bit faster out of control. I've got that funnel cloud forming above my head. And things are starting to compound on themselves, right? So I'm not really thinking clearly. I go to put on my bunker coat. Usually I want my strap on the inside of my coat, but my strap wasn't set in the right place. So my radio strap's on the outside of the coat, which is where I don't want it. So I try to get that all buckled in. And now I'm really starting to get behind the eight ball. Now, as I was running down the hallway, I was thinking, gosh, I'm a new lieutenant. I have no idea where this apartment complex is. I really hope that map is working on our MDC so they can map me in there because I don't know what's going on. And of course, as soon as I get to the MDC and I acknowledge that call, the GPS is down. I have no idea how to get there, what I'm doing, where I'm going. Starting to twist a little bit further and lose focus on what I need to do in this emergency. So got their engineer. I'm already behind the eight ball. Everybody else is moving forward. They're in the rig. They're ready to go. The engine's all getting started up. And I'm not seeing clearly now, right? Things are starting to lose focus for me. I'm starting to get a little bit farther behind in where I need to be going to approach this incident. So, put on my David Clark headset. I go to acknowledge on the radio that we are in routes, but I'm on the wrong channel. So dispatch comes back, engine one, you're on the wrong channel, switch over to tap four. So I gotta fiddle with that and figure that out. And then of course I've got a brand new probationary firefighter in the back, and I've got a brand new paramedic, and they're both cackling like a bunch of little chicks that are hungry for their food, right? They're so excited, and so I can't hear what dispatch is saying in the first place. All of this is starting to compound on itself, and I have absolutely no control of the situation. And this funnel crowd is getting faster, and it's starting to sink a lot more down to the ground. 
Now that engine's really getting revved up and we're getting ready to pull out, right? My engineer pulls out onto the apron and says, all right, which way are we turning? I have no freaking clue which way we're turning. Okay, so I pull out the map book, and at this point I can't even see straight, right? So I'm trying to look at the map book. I don't know which map uh, section we're supposed to be on. I don't know which way we're supposed to turn. So I just, well, I can go left or right, right? Let's go left. I'll try to figure it out as we start moving. So we pull out of the, the engine bay, we make that left turn, and we start on our process of driving down towards that call. That funnel cloud is really starting to thin now. My mind is out of control. I'm not focusing on what I need to do. My vision literally narrows down and I can't see the map book. I can't focus on where my engineer is driving to. I'm having a lot of different problems with things moving forward. That's a negative, uh, RP's Finally, as I pull up to the house, we find a way to get there. I'm not thinking of where a hydrant is. I'm not thinking of where any of the other incoming units are at. My only problem, the only focus that I'm looking at is getting myself out of this situation because I know I'm in big trouble as it is. So, as we pull up to this structure fire, it's looking bad, and I have no concept nor any interest in trying to manage the incident as a lieutenant should be, as I have been trained. All I want to do is pass command, I want to go fast attack, and I want to send my crews in so somebody else can take responsibility for this entrance incident because I am in no mind to be able to do so, right? So what do I do? Rather than taking the time and moving forward and doing as I'm trained, I go in fast attack mode. I take my brand new probationary firefighter, I take my really pretty newly minted paramedic and go bowling in straight through the front door in this house. No idea what we've got. What do we do? We walk in right over basement fire. The floor falls out from underneath us. All three of us fall in. We burn up. We kill three of us and the two people that were out on the other side of that house begging for us to save them. All because I allowed every single situation to compound on itself and cause me to make poor, poor decisions on an emergency. That's my nightmare. That's what keeps me up at night. Does anybody else, am I the only one, within your professions? I know we've got a lot of different professions out here, right? But this can happen to any one of us, whether you're a firefighter, police officer, in emergency management, ER doc. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in our industry, and if we're not prepared for it, um, it's a big challenge. So. That's my nightmare. That's kind of where we're setting the stage for today. We're kind of down at the bottom of the valley, and we're going to try to take a journey. We're going to try to hike up to the top of that mountain today. Try to get a feel for what options are out there, what the problems are that we're facing, and how we can potentially try to um, tackle those problems as we move forward. So, without further ado, anybody ever sat in a briefing and been in a presentation where the presenter puts up this slide and there's another 30 behind them, and they sit there and they read the Latin. Um, I don't like that. It, it drives me crazy. So my, my goal as I've built and done presentations is to not let people fall asleep in them, or at least try not to have them fall asleep, and really not be boring. So I'll try that for you today. So if you can for me, just try to stay awake. I see some bright, bushy eyes. I know, Frank, you're, you're fresh. This is good. 2008, I was hired on with the Aurora Fire Department and uh, was really excited, moved forward, and then July 20th, 2012, the captain of my uh, engine was an acting chief, and he had texted me at 4 in the morning with this text message. I just commanded the largest mass shooting in USA history. 50 people shot. Our guys did an awesome job. I will tell you about it later. Schizo on steroids. Schizo is his mnemonic for how to manage a, a complex emergency. So first off, I was really irritated that I didn't get to go to this call, right? We had initially gotten called out to go to the bombing scene. And second, I thought, gosh, this is a, a pivotal moment in the fire and police history. I, I want to you know, take this and run with it. So the Royal Theater shooting kind of um, guided my personal and professional career from that point on. Luckily, I got accepted to this place. Couldn't be more excited, couldn't be more honored. But then, you know, I wrote one of these things, right? And as uh, Austin Butner had said yesterday, people won't even read a press release, let alone a 100-page thesis. So I thought, well, gosh, I put all this work into it. I might as well do something. I might as well try to present it and get some of those ideas out there. So this is kind of a culmination of that. I like to break things down into nice bite-sized chunks. So I've got three separate chunks, essentially, that we're going to talk about today. And then I'll break those down into three separate chunks as we move forward. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is what the future is looking like, what the future is today, and what it's going to look like in the future. Uh, the state of the community what the state of our current emergency response community is, and then potentially a way forward, how we can start moving forward with some of that. 
A lot of what I talk about today is focused primarily on first responders. So those first level people, police, fire, um, paramedics, ambulance, that will be responding to that incident. But I would submit to each of you as we're talking about this that a lot of the lessons that we've learned from the aviation industry here are definitely applicable to each one of your industries, whether you're in um, emergency management um, or, or the latter. So um, kind of keep that in mind. So what does the future look like? Future looks like this dude, right? The millennial. So there was a study done a few years ago by the government. They said millennials now represent the largest generation in the United States. What's more, the single one year age cohort of those millennials is 24 years old. So the far greatest working group that's in the industry right now is 24 years old. That means they are here and they're going to be here for quite a long time. So it's something that we're going to have to look at and deal with. So, what is the stereotypical millennial? What do they look like? What do they do? They're like, this guy? I mean, this guy is cool, right? I don't know where he's going or what he's doing, but I kind of want to follow him there. And I think I want a cigarette just to be looking that cool. I don't know what he's doing. Or maybe it's, it's this guy right here. He's in his parents' basement. It's 12 in the afternoon. It's a Tuesday morning. Yeah, so he, he's doing that. Maybe it's this guy still. One in the afternoon, he woke up, and now he's playing some video games and, and drinking. But you know, I would, I would argue that this is not the millennial we're getting into our industry, right? This is the millennial we're getting in our industry. We're getting the ones that are at school, studying, working hard, trying to make a difference in their lives and in the lives of the community that they're in. They're volunteering. They are in class on Saturdays, going to EMT school, going to paramedic school, doing what they can to get into our industry. But what's unique about these individuals and these millennials is they have a very visceral appreciation for how the world is today. Just like the baby boomer had the Vietnam War, Cuban Missile Crisis, things like that, that really shaped who they are as an individual, we have a number of different things that have happened throughout our lives as we've grown up that have really shaped us. For example, I was a sophomore in high school at Golden High School, which is in Jeffco in Colorado, during Columbine. I had friends, I had a girlfriend that were at Columbine High School, so as I'm sitting in my math class watching TV and watching these kids run out of the school, that puts an indelible mark on a person, right? September 11th, 2001, my first day at the University of Denver as a freshman in college. Here I am going into the hospitality industry, excited about what life has to offer, and I'm watching the towers fall. The world has completely and forever changed as of this day when I am starting out my life and moving forward. So it, it leaves a mark. Now a lot of the people and individuals, my peers for example, immediately went off and joined the military. So they have seen and done and been through things that many of us can't even imagine, right? Jumped out of planes, they've been all over the world. They have seen and they have done things that we can't imagine. So they have that leadership, they have those skills and those experiences. But maybe they came back, they got deployed, they came back and they used their GI Bill and they went to Virginia Tech in 2007, right when the shooting happened at Virginia Tech. What kind of mark does that leave on them? Or maybe they got a place back at Fort Hood, Navy Yard. Maybe they went to uh, the Aurora Theater and were there during that incident itself. Or maybe they even had kids at that point in time and they were old enough to be at Newtown. What kind of mark does that leave on you if you have a kid that is old enough to be in elementary school and however many children are, are, are killed in an elementary school? So the question, Ryan, come on now, is so what? Well, we are the future. And as I've kind of mentioned, that's kind of a reality and that's something that we'll all have to start to work through. And I think it's a good thing. You know, we're really working hard, um, studying, graduating, embracing technology, now I gotta be careful, as soon as I say this slide, start talking about technology, inevitably something of the technology that I use on this presentation completely dies out. So it's, it's the God saying, Ryan, quit talking about technology. But I've got my Apple Watch and I've seen a couple Apple Watches around today. I love my Apple Watch people. I can advance my slides on my Apple Watch, right? Technology is massive and there are opportunities out there um, really great for us. The other thing about technology is we're used to change when it comes to technology. Our Facebook profile changes completely every two weeks. We get over it, we move on, and we appreciate it and move forward. The, the baby boomer generation, at least in Aurora, 
for the past three years and for the next three to five years are in a massive exodus. And I'm sure it's similar in a lot of your organizations, right? They're on their way out. They have a lot of lessons to give, um, but also sometimes they might be a little bit resistant to change. In my humble experience, maybe that's just an Aurora. So working to, to change those things um, can, can be a bit of a challenge. You know, we're promoting to captain, to sergeant, a number of different things. The second in charge of our department in Aurora is 37 years old. Second in charge, pretty impressive. And moving up within all the different organizations. And eventually, we will be the future leaders of the organizations that we are a part of. So you think, really? We are the future leaders of the police departments, the fire departments, the emergency management departments that we're a part of? That scares the heck out of me. That's where my nightmare comes from, right? There is not a lot out there that's great. It's not all roses and puppy dogs and rainbows out there. There's a lot of horrible things that we're having to deal with. Namely, the problem that we have between the public and the police officers in our field today. I would not want to be a police officer right now and deal with the challenges that you deal with. I feel for you every single day. Not to mention, we have to deal with the politics of every single component of that as well. So there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to do. And we've got about 30 years to figure it out and do it. So I submit to all of you this morning that our role, our challenge, our responsibility is to start embracing some of that technology. Keep cool, calm, and collected on emergencies that we are faced with. And change that culture. Play nice in the sandbox. Break down those massive silos that we've built up as we've been moving forward. Learn from other industries and really facilitate trust, teamwork, um, and relationships with all the people that we are interacting with on a daily basis. And we need to do that in an environment of significantly increasing complexity. And we'll talk a lot about that right in a little bit. So now you're probably thinking, Ryan, what in the heck are you talking about? And why did I get up early for this? OK, so we're going to keep delving into this. That was the first chunk, right? We're going to continue to move forward. And hopefully, we'll start putting some lights on and, and move forward from there. So second chunk. State of the community. The state of the community that we are all kind of in right now, just to kind of get a quick overview for you. So again, break this up into three chunks for you. The first three are the three types of um, focus that we have on an emergency. So in any emergency or any incident that you are participating in, three points of focus. The first is what I call task saturation. So if you're task saturated, you're like these guys on the boat, right? That guy up front is doing nothing but thinking about the rowing, the oar, getting in the water and pushing as hard as humanly possible. He's not thinking about where the boat's going. He's not thinking about the cadence they're on. He's not thinking about anything but brute force, let's row. He's saturated in that task. Move forward a little bit, there's tactical saturation. So those are the individuals like the lieutenant, like this um, coxswain, who is focused on not only what they're doing in their task, but how to get there, what the cadence of their rowing is, where they are within the purpose of the race so they can begin to move forward and make a difference and win that race. But they're focused on being only in their lane, right? They're doing one tactic to accomplish an objective via their tasks. The third component is strategic. A strategic saturation or a strategic focus is, okay, we've got this boat with their tasks and their tactics, they are rowing toward an objective, you've got another boat, and so on. We need to strategically make sure all of those boats go toward the, the goal or the objective that we want to get to. So tactics, task, and um, excuse me, task, tactics, and strategic um, is the, the focus for that. Moving forward, there's three types of problems that we face on any type of an emergency. The first is what I call a simple problem, right? So a simple problem is you can follow a recipe. You may not know how to cook, but if you can read and follow a recipe, you can probably make some cookies and not burn them too horribly as long as you follow that recipe, right? So it's simple. We've got protocols in place to be able to fix the problem, and, and it works pretty well. A complicated problem is a little bit more challenging, obviously. So back in the 60s when we went to the moon, that was a pretty tough problem. But if we had enough money and we wanted to go to the moon in a year from now, We've already got the principles, we've already got the process. We could probably do it in relatively easy and short order. Um, it would be a challenge, but it's a complicated problem. It's not too horrible. Now, the final type of problem, that's what I'm going to talk about and, and um, integrate into this talk for the rest of the day is what I call a complex problem. So this is a complex problem right here.
<laughs> so that's my son, Bromley. He's uh, three months right now. And um, I've got this figured out, right? New dad, no problem. I know that that cry, there's no tears. There's no real whining. That's not a real cry that I need to do anything about. I can just hold him. He's just playing games. He just wants attention, right? But I know what the hungry cry is. I know what the change me cry is. And I know what the I'm tired screaming my bloody head off cry is. And I can handle all those. Put onto that, my wife had a really easy pregnancy. He sleeps nine hours a night in his own crib. Things are good, right? So you know what that means. My wife's going to want another one. Therein lies the problem, right? That second child is going to be a devil child, guaranteed. Because anything that I've learned and figured out and understood in how I approached Bromley the first time around is not going to work whatsoever, I'm, I hear, with the second child. That's the essence of a complex problem. You have an actor that is a human that is trying to immediately change the way that they um, are causing problems for you than the one previous to it. So, an active shooter situation, even though we train for it, is completely different in Aurora versus San Bernardino versus Navy Yard. We can train to some of those things, but that human actor is trying to always shake things up for us. It's complex. It changes different components like that. So, finally, there's three types of emergencies that we face. In general, on the line, um, on a given day. The first, it's a police-only emergency, a law enforcement-only emergency. Law enforcement is in charge, they manage, they run, fire and ambulance as well as essentially ancillarily assist or help out, right? Then there's the, the fire-only emergency. That is where fire is in charge, whether it's a structure fire or a crash on the highway or something like that. Police will essentially come in, they will assist, they will help out, and they will stop with any jokes about police and fire on fire scenes. We'll just leave it at that. The final type of emergency that we face and that we're facing a significant amount more these days is those combined police fire events. That is where police are in charge, literally. I mean, it is some type of event where law enforcement needs to be in charge, needs to be managing that incident. But there's also a component of individuals who are injured that also need to be taken care of, that we need to get in there as a fire department and also engage. The problem is we're engaging at the same time in the same geographic space with each other. It's like oil and water sometimes, right? Sometimes we just simply can't work well together in that space because we're not used to doing it. So that's some of the components that we're talking about with those type of complex incidents. But it's not the Navy Yard shootings, it's not the San Bernardinos, it's the small incidents that happen every single day that are complex. And that's where we can start to learn and practice. So for example, tonight, or maybe even last night, no, Frank, you're here, so we're good. Okay. But tonight, in any bar across any city in the United States, there is going to be a seven foot, 300 pound guy that goes into the bathroom of the bar and he's going to take out his heroin and he's going to shoot up, right? And what's going to happen? He's going to overdose. He's going to be unconscious in this nasty, scary bar and he is going to um, need help. So they're going to call the police. The police are already on edge. They're already gonna come into this bar, they know that bad things happen here, and they see this massive guy that's unconscious on the floor in the bar. So, police show up, paramedics show up, they start doing their assessment. The paramedic, if they're not a good paramedic, may decide, oh, I know what this is, this is a heroin overdose, I'm gonna give him Narcan. He's a big guy, I'm gonna give him about five milligrams worth. I'm just gonna shoot it straight in his arm. What happens if you give somebody Narcan really fast? They come out wanting to fight and they want to fight hard. You've taken away their high. You've completely reversed what's happening and what they're enjoying in life, even though they weren't breathing doing it, right? So you stop their high, reverse that, they come out swinging. Now, what happens if that paramedic does not talk to the police who don't necessarily have medical training and say, okay, I'm gonna give him a medication that's gonna make him come up swinging. Here's what we need to do. It's a medical problem. He's not trying to fight us. Police are justifiably going to react in kind and take the guy down with force. That doesn't have to be that way. If the paramedic talks with the police officer, figures out what's going on, hey, here's what's gonna happen, then they can manage that small, complex incident um, on, a, on a normal scale. Scale that up, the wheel just gets bigger on a large scale complex emergency. We've seen them, Kenya, Boston, as I said, San Bernardino. Those are complex emergencies. There's just more people involved in that same geographic space, right? So you talk about Aurora. Three things went very well within the after action report that was done. The first thing was 
tasks, or excuse me, yeah, tasks. Everybody that was on the scene, police and fire, did the tasks that they were assigned or that they see needed, see needed to be done immediately, and they did it very well. Tactics. The officers that were on the scene tactically worked with each other, both police and fire, and figured out how to transport these people, all those different components. And strategy, the fire commander and the police commander had a strategy in mind and they executed it flawlessly, but they weren't together. So those are the problems, those were what needed work. And of course, three things that needed work, and these are all very similar, we see them all the time. Police and fire commanders did not establish a unified command. They didn't have those policies in place. The police department was unable to or did not know how to communicate directly with the fire department. Seen that before. And finally, the fire department personnel did not participate in regular communications or interoperability drills. Communications didn't work. Again, seen that. After seeing these after action reports ad nauseum and saying, gosh, you know what? We need to do something about this and we can't keep trying to fix the problems in house. There's no reason for us to. Firefighters and police officers try to fix their own problems. But there's gotta be another industry, there's gotta be another group that's figured these problems out. There's gotta be similar issues that they've fixed that we can just take and steal and utilize for us, right? I'm, I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. So, learning from other industries, and that's kind of where this came about as far as, you know, how can we start thinking about this? So what I asked was, what can the aviation industry teach emergency services field personnel about how to approach complex, life-sensitive problems. There's that word again, right? Complex. So what has the aviation industry done that's complex? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But aviation, they've, they've learned some lessons over the 50 or 60 years between uh, you know, when things have really started to come about. First lesson they learned was uh, on October 30th, 1935 in Wright Field, Ohio. That was when the Boeing company brought their Model 299 aircraft and they were going to show it off for the government and they were going to try to make this the new bomber for the future because we were potentially going to war out in Germany, right? So they brought it out there, they were going to show it off, everything was great, so they started to take off, the two pilots got it going and went straight up into the air and crashed right back down to the ground. Both of the pilots ended up dying eventually from their injuries and it was a pretty horrible event and the, uh, the government said, you know what, we're scrapped. We can't handle this new technology. These airplanes are just simply too much airplane for one person to fly. It's too complex, there's too much to do. One person can't do it. Boeing, being the um, interested party that they were, decided, you know what, we're not gonna just leave it at that. There could be some more issues with that. So they went through and they looked and they said, it's not too much airplane for one person to fly. It's too much memory for one pilot to keep track of. So what did they do? They came up with a checklist. So every day before a pilot takes off, they utilize a checklist, they follow through it. So in terms of that plane crashing, the pilot didn't switch one switch that let the elevators move once they're not in the wind. So if they had gone through the checklist, hit that switch, they would have been perfectly fine. So the checklist really helped to bring the aviation industry forward and launch that technology forward as well. That worked pretty well until you know the late 1970s. Um, United Airlines had a flight from Denver out to Portland, Oregon. It was uh, flight 19, oh, excuse me, 173. And essentially what happened is as they were flying through, they had a, a light come on, an error light that said there was a problem with their landing gear. As soon as they started focusing on that light, they didn't focus on anything else. You had that captain, that I'm the captain, don't talk to me, don't tell me what to do kind of mentality in there. So everybody was too afraid to tell the captain anything that they were concerned about. So all they did for the next hour and a half was focus on that light. What can they do? How can they fix it? What can they think about? All the while the co-pilot's saying, uh, Captain, we're almost out of fuel. Captain, don't talk to me. I don't wanna hear it. So they're about 15 minutes out from landing and he says, okay, we're gonna land. We're just gonna try to do this. Captain, we only have five minutes of fuel left. So the plane crashed. A perfectly airworthy plane crashed because the pilots didn't jive well. That's a pretty significant problem. So what did they do? They created Crew Resource Management, or CRM. That is how to make the human dynamic of airplane flying work better. So Crew Resource, crew resource Management um, really has three specific and main components that we'll talk about quickly today. The first is the introduction. Second is trust and teamwork. And the third is the pre-flight briefing. So all of those different components in a short form are, are really what make um, airlines tick. So the first, the introduction. So Atul Gawande is um, 
really kind of got me going with a lot of this. He has a book called The Checklist Manifesto. If you haven't heard of it, it's a fantastic read. I would definitely suggest it. But he really delved into this component of the introduction. How do we break down those barriers with the people that we need to get to know? And he said, you know, although that we are constantly admonished not to judge a book by its cover, the human brain works by doing precisely that. The brain continually takes shortcuts. So if we see that bad captain or that bad lieutenant or that bad captain, we're not going to want to approach them and create a relationship just because that that aura of that. However, if you just go up and have a quick handshake and introduce yourself, something as simple as that has the power to disarm those snap judgments and open the mind. So if I go up, hi, I'm Ryan. Good to meet you. We're going to be working together today. Um, if there's anything that you need, I'm, I'm here for you. Just that alone, we're, we're good, right? We're, we're closer than we were just a few minutes ago. So you bring that back into the aviation world. So Sully Sullenberger, he was the guy on um, US Airways. He landed in the Hudson. Sully is my captain. He's, you know, I have the t-shirt and the hat. Nobody has that? All right. Sully and his partner, Skiles, Jeffrey Skiles, were both incredible pilots. They both had 30 years of experience. Skiles was only the co-pilot because he had transferred into a new aircraft because of budget cuts, right? They were both incredibly highly skilled. They both knew exactly what they were doing. So one might say, well, okay, if they're both highly skilled, they don't really necessarily need to know each other. They'd never met before. In all their years of flying with US Airways, they had never met before this flight um, and this sequence of flights that they were going on. So that doesn't matter, right? They should, they should get to know each other. So okay, let's, let's bring it to another context then. Let's say, Duke has a massive game. They're in the championship, right? But the coaches aren't really available, and there's some kind of issues with that. So they say, all right, well, we've got two highly skilled coaches here. Obviously, one of them is already the coach there. But let's just get Bobby Knight and Mike Krzyzewski, and let's bring them together. And they're going to coach this team. They know of each other, but they've never coached together before. Game starts in two minutes. Ready, go. You think they're going to win? I think the chairs are going to be thrown across. I think there's going to be a bunch of basketballs that are punted around. But they're probably not going to win the game, even though those are two highly skilled coaches. Why then, if you have a really highly skilled fire officer or chief and a really highly skilled police officer or chief, do they not need to get to know each other and work together um, on any type of complex emergency? So trust and teamwork. Anybody ever seen or heard of the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team? So they do what's called the haka. go play some rugby. No? No, not me. I'm out. Holy cow. That's a scary team. Those guys know what they're doing, right? Talk about a fixed, close-knit team that will kill anybody that comes toward them. Not going to do it. So the question is, how did they get that way? I mean, that is impressive stuff, right? Well, I would probably suggest that every single kid in New Zealand from the age of one on is doing this. This kid right up here is thinking, you know, I'm going to play golf. <laughs> I'm out. That's scary. So, obviously, they've wanted to be on the New Zealand All Blacks from the beginning. We haven't necessarily had that chance. And of course, we haven't had a Heather Isfaran that's teaching us how to do the haka from age whatever, right? So, 
The question is, can that be done with a swift starting, ad hoc team that comes together at a complex emergency and act as cohesive as the New Zealand All Blacks? And I argue absolutely, because the aviation industry does it every single day. They figured it out, they know what to do, and there's four components. Sorry, it's from three to four, I had to up it for this one. First of all, they have a shared team identity. Everybody in that aircraft knows what the objective is, what the goal is, and how to get what they need to do done. They have an identity as pilots. We can have the same thing within our industries. Everybody has that identity, they can move forward. Taking input from everyone. Now this is a tough one for some people, right? Especially in the environment that I talked about with the new millennials that are coming in. If you have, like in our department, SEALs and snipers and people that have done incredible things in their early life, but they're 26 years old and now they're trying to work with that old salty engineer or lieutenant that has nothing, that want, he wants nothing um, to do with that person and definitely doesn't want to take any input from them. If they're in the midst of a firefight or if they're getting ready to go into something, don't you think he should take input from the guy that's been in it, in Fallujah, doing those horrible things? They know what they're doing, right? Know your role in relation to the overall objective. Okay, I know my task, I know my tactic, and I know the strategy that we are trying to get accomplished here. Focusing on that. Help and support others in their tasks. So if the engineer, Frank, if the engineer needs help getting the hose off of the engine and you're the chief, go out there and help him, right? Yeah, just don't, don't hurt yourself. Cool, all right. So all those different components really come into play. Finally, the pre-flight briefing. The pre-flight briefing is a really impressive thing that they do, again, every single day before a shift. Formal briefings involve joint review of information, joint situation assessment, and joint decision making in relation to flight decisions. What's that keyword? Joint. Everybody's together from the radio crew, the ground crew, flight attendants, and both pilots all come together. They do a joint pre-flight briefing, so they're all in understanding of what's going to happen if something goes wrong. It happens every single day in every single country around the world. Now, paramedics, if you're a good paramedic or a good EMT, you should do this every morning, right? As you come in, if you haven't worked with your EMT or paramedic partner before, you're probably gonna wanna do a pre-shift briefing or a pre-flight check, right? So if there is a cardiac arrest in the field and it's a medical cardiac arrest, versus a traumatic cardiac arrest, there's a multitude of different ways that I, as a paramedic, would manage that incident, right? If it's a medical, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna work on that patient for 10, 20 minutes, see if we can bring that patient back. But if it's a traumatic injury, I'm going to take that patient, I'm gonna board them, and I'm gonna to run to the hospital, I'm gonna give them to you. But if my EMT or my paramedic doesn't appreciate or understand that that's the plan, and we get onto the scene of a traumatic cardiac arrest and they wanna stay and play, we're not working, we're not jiving well, and we're not doing well for that patient. Firefighters, a good lieutenant who has not worked with their fire department or that, those crew in the past should do a pre-shift briefing. Okay, if we have a fire, I want you and you to come with me. I want you to stay at the rig. We're gonna do a 360. We're gonna figure this out. Got it? That took what, 30 seconds? Police do it. SWAT teams, they're great about doing their pre-shift briefings, pre-incident briefings. So why in we in emergency management and in our other fields do we not do a pre-shift briefing with some of the other agencies that are out there? It's a red flag day here in California. Let's reach out to the sheriff's office. Let's reach out to the state. Okay guys, we got something that pops today. Here's what we're gonna do. Here's who we're gonna call. Here's my cell phone number. Call me directly. Things like that. Step it up even further to a complex emergency, an active shooter, something to that effect. Why not do a pre-shift briefing with the people we're gonna be responding with doing those introductions, setting that trust and teamwork and moving forward. So, second chunk's down, we're almost there. Airmanship. So as we kind of continue on this journey, once pilots and groups have mastered the checklists and crew resource management, those that are really good progress up to airmanship. Airmanship is one of those disciplines, those techniques that if you're, if you're a good pilot, boy, you're one of the best. So, Atul Gawande, again, he talks about airmanship, and you know, we talk about the uh, Blue Angels here because they are the, the epitome of that, right? But he says, discipline is hard. It's harder than trustworthiness and skill, and perhaps even than selflessness. We are, by nature, flawed and inconstant creatures. 
He says, you know, we can't even keep from snacking between meals. We're just not built for discipline. The human mind is just not built to stay focused on the task at hand. We always want to go off and chase squirrels, find beer, things like that, right? So we're built for novelty and excitement, not for careful attention to detail. Discipline is something that we have to work at. That's perhaps why aviation has made discipline or airmanship the norm. So they figured it out. They've got a number of different tools to teach airmanship and discipline, and they're doing a fantastic job about it. So you think, all right, what kind of examples would there be for that? So we, we go back to the US Airways flight as they lost power, both geese went into the engines, they're flying out of LaGuardia, they need to go back and figure out a place to land, right? So immediately, Sully Sullenberg took the controls of the plane, he knew we're not gonna make it back to the airport, we're gonna have to try to land in the Hudson. But Skiles, he had the discipline to pull out the checklist and try to relight both of those engines immediately knowing probably it wasn't going to work. They tried to test that in simulators after the fact, and it was almost impossible to do. He was that focused, that disciplined in getting that done. But it didn't stop there. Skiles, in addition to trying to do the relight check, also set the plane up to be ditched into the Hudson. There's a whole checklist for that. There's a whole different components of things that need to happen in order to do a ditching procedure. Well, Andy, I know it's sometimes not ditching, I'm sorry. But typically, that's what he was doing, right? So. Having the discipline, having the airmanship to not freak out, to focus on what you need to do as the co-pilot while your pilot is landing that plane um, was pretty significant. Richard DeCrisby in uh, November 2010, he had his engine explode on that Qantas A380 and had some pretty significant issues there. In order to come in and land, he needed to do what was called control checks, and that had never really happened before. And essentially, at 4,000 feet, instead of 1,000 feet, he decided, all right, let's mock land this plane. Let's get everything ready. Let's see if we can get this plane to land, and if things don't work, we can pull up at 3,000 feet instead of on the ground, right? That had never happened before, but he had the discipline, he had the airmanship to say, we need to do this. So a lot of those different components. Now, let's, let's bring this over to the complex emergencies that we're facing. If we can have the discipline not to self-dispatch ourselves, not to go running straight into that house that's on fire or into that area that people are shooting in and set up command, do the things that we need to do in a disciplined manner, I think that would be a lot of uh, benefit that would come for that. Okay, right. we're getting close, and then we can start having some conversations too. We're, we're almost there. We're almost up to the top of this mountain, right? So we've been hiking, we've been working, we're on that cliff's edge. We've talked about that airmanship, but there's another level. There's another level that's just a bit higher than that, that's the pinnacle, that will bring everything together for us, and that's what's called mindfulness. Mindfulness is a new technique and a new term that I've just recently learned, so I'll kind of give you a quick um, synopsis of that, essentially, right now. In a nutshell, mindfulness is keeping a focus on the present moment appreciating the fact that that water is doing exactly what it's doing, not focusing on what happened to the water five minutes before, not focusing on what's going to happen five minutes after that. You're focused on the present moment itself. So just like this cute little kiddo, just focus on that toy he's got and what's happening with the camera. The beauty of that is mindfulness can be kind of just like a best friend that's keeping your mind free of all the distractions and things that are going on. Now, mindfulness has literally been proven to completely reduce your heart rate, reduce your blood pressure, and allow you to focus on chaotic tasks at hand in a very calm, confident manner. It's absolutely fascinating, and we're really trying to do a lot with it. So to give you an example of, of a quick mindfulness trick, um, Anne Marie Rossi, who I'm working with in the Denver area, is a mindfulness practitioner. She understands a lot of this. She says, okay, here's just a quick one. First, just breathe. That's the mnemonic for this process, right? So first, fist. Any of you ever been really stressed out and you look down at your wrist and you've got bloody marks on your hand from your fist being so tight together? Your fists really hold a lot of tension. So if first, fist, you release your fist, relax your hands, that will help you out quite a bit. The next part of that, just the J stands for jaw. How many of you are aware of how tight your jaw can be when you're stressed out? You're holding it tight, you're not moving things around. If you consciously focus on ah, releasing that jaw, that will help to relax you significantly. And then finally, breathe. Take one mindful, slow, deep breath. 
And that will immediately lower your heart rate. So the next time you're stressed out, the next time you're nervous, try that. Fist, jaw, release your jaw. One mindful breath. That will immediately lower your heart rate measurably. Your blood pressure measurably. And all of those different components. I did it over here when I was getting ready to come on, right? Because I was a little nervous. So all of that starts to come into play. First, just breathe. So now, my nightmare, we started off with that, right? That was the problem that I had and that it keeps me awake at night. But if I start to incorporate all the things that we've talked about today, so I come into the, the station in the morning, I shake hands with all the people that I'm working with, we do our pre-shift briefing, we set up that teamwork, we appreciate where we're going, I call the sergeant on the police side that I'm gonna be working with for the day and I say, hey, I'm here, here's my cell phone, if we have something crazy, I'm gonna call you on your channel and then we'll meet up face to face, is that okay? Perfect, so I got everything set up. Now. When this call drops. Engine three, engine two, three, truck right? two, tower eight, yeah. the rig, battalion one, chief seven. It's going to be a good structure fire. Okay, good. Address uh, is around 17th and Peoria. 17th and Peoria. I think we I know where that is. Yet. But he didn't uh, give me the map page. Engine I'm going to have to look two, that up. Truck two, truck eight, does the rig. Those are my clues that are coming. Seven. This is going to be a good fire. Respond to 17th and Peoria. Um, TAC four, TAC four. Tack 4, I need to go Tack 4. is the correct address, and engine 2, command, be aware we have multiple parties trapped. I believe they said 307. Okay, we're working. It's a real job, right? We've got people trapped. I know the location, but I don't know the map page, and I'm concerned that the computer's been acting up. So before I run out, I'm going to quickly walk over to the map board, look up 17th and Peoria, and find where that map page is. Okay, perfect. So, things are going well. I get out, I, I go to my bunker gear. I've done that first just breathe at least three or four times now, right? Just to keep myself focused in that present moment. I go to put on my bunker gear, put all the stuff up, and I got my strap still right around in between my leg. Oh, jeez. Cool, no big deal. Pull it out, grab my hood, put my hood on because I'm feeling more confident, get my bunker pants up, don my bunker coat with my radio in the right spot, and I hop on the rig. MDC's not working, darn it. Okay, well, it was four Charlie four on the map page, so I'll get ready to pull that up, and uh, I'm gonna switch my radio over to TAC four. First, just breathe again. Okay, perfect. Engine starts up. Feeling good. I know which way we're gonna turn now because I've got a good feel for that because I've already looked on the map. I've got the radio, the headset on, so I've changed that channel, I acknowledge where we're going, and I tell the guys in back, hey, quit cackling back there. I need to hear where we're going. You've got the plan, so everybody's ready. They appreciate where we're going and what we're doing. Engine's getting going, and we're getting ready to pull out. Engineer pulls out on the apron, right? Okay, which way, left or right? Left, perfect. Left, and then down to Peoria Street. I'm looking at the map. I'm checking out where all the hydrants are. I can appreciate where the staging area is gonna be, so I focus on all those different components. And then we drive off, take that left turn. Things are more clear now. I'm doing my mindfulness techniques, my mindfulness breathing, checking out the map one more time, but I'm also looking around. Okay, are we driving safely? Are there things that we need to focus on? Is there a person crossing the street that I need to make sure my engineer knows about? Okay, green light, good. We're, we're doing well, we're getting there. Pull up to that scene. I'm focused, I'm confident, I'm gonna manage this scene well, right? Okay. Fire dispatch, engine one's on scene. Two-story, multi-family structure. We have heavy smoke from, showing from the Alpha, Bravo corner. Engine one's going to be Peoria Command, doing a 360, investigating. All units stage away, please. Give me some time to work, give me some time to figure it out. I bring my probationary firefighter with me because we talked about it already. We're gonna do a 360 around the structure. As we're doing the 360, I'm gonna see, hey, we've got people trapped out on that side. We've got a basement fire in the window well down below. Okay, that changes my tactics. I'm going to be going transitional. We're gonna start putting fire, excuse me, water on the fire in the basement, and then we will transition inside from a different entrance. I'm going to assign the truck crew to come in and rescue those people that need rescuing up on that top side. All of the different components went from a horrible tragedy to heroes, right? All because I was focused, I was mindful, and I had done all of the different components that we talked about earlier today. So that's mindfulness. So we've taken a bit of a journey today. We've started out talking about my nightmare. 
where my concerns are and how I want to manage things. And then we talked about you know, the, the state of the, the, the future, the people, the millennials that are coming into our area. And then we kind of hiked across over here and we talked about the state of the community, right? The challenges that we face, the problems that we face, the complexities that are out there. And then we started learning from other industries. So we talked about aviation and crew resource management um, and the checklists and different things like that. Um, and then we talked about airmanship. Airmanship, discipline, really having that focus, having that ability. And then finally, if we can get up to the pinnacle, if we can bring all of that together and approach every emergency, combined emergency, with a mindful appreciation for the situation, man, we're unstoppable, right? If we can bring all of this together and manage our emergencies with such efficiency, such gusto, I would submit that most terrorists that are going to try to attack my city are going to think twice about it, right? Boy, they are so well prepared. They are so on point. They are not going to want to come over and respond because they're not going to create as much damage as they want to. They're going to go to the next city. But the next city's got all these techniques too. We are such a robust country in how we manage our emergencies. They're going to think twice. That's the vision that I have. Um, so, you know, at this point, I think it's, it's good for us. We don't necessarily need to do a question and answer simply because I have no answers for you. I'm sure of it. But if you want to have a bit of a discussion or conversation and kind of talk about some of the different components, what you guys are doing, any thoughts, um, let's, let's chat a little bit. <laughs>